This morning, I want to focus our thoughts on serving the Lord and the grace that God gives to us when we serve the Lord. And incidentally, God is no man's debtor. Therefore, when you serve him, there is an unintended benefit that comes into your life. And I'm going to try my best to share that with you from a very important uh, chapter in the Bible, Romans chapter 12. It's about serving the Lord, experiencing and using the gifts God has given and the grace that God provides with it so that our whole life is blessed and we see his hand upon us not only among the people of God or in the church but also in the marketplace because as far as the word of God is concerned you don't live two lives it's one life one among the people of God and the same life seamlessly flows in into the marketplace wherever you are that's what the Bible teaches us Romans chapter 12 so let's read together these very foundational verses verses 1 and 2 Romans 12 verse 1 and 2 all together now I beseech you therefore brethren by the mercies of God that you present your bodies a living sacrifice holy acceptable to God which is your reasonable service and do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may approve what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. This talks about being a living martyr. By the way, let me ask you a Bible quiz question. Who was the first martyr of the Christian church? Who can shout out the name? Stephen, Stephen right. Very good found in Acts chapter 7 and he sacrificed his life he died for the gospel because of his witness that is where the word martyr comes from martyr means a person who bears witness for what he has seen and experienced even if it means death and Stephen was the first martyr and here the Apostle Paul talks about being a living martyr dying to yourself every day and being uh, an offering a sacrifice to God for his kingdom's work and the call is to all say it after me the call to all to be a living master say it again the call to all to be a living martyr and he explains for us how that happens we know that there are many people who are being martyred for the cause of Christ physically that is happening God bless those faithful servants around the world who are sacrificing their lives their blood has not been spilt in vain their voices cry out before the throne of God but here the Apostle Paul is talking about being a living martyr and like I said the quadruplets of salvation service self-denial and sanctification remember that from last Sunday those are inseparable if you know the Lord you will serve him then you will experience self-denial that will be the call and then sanctification will take place in your life and here he speaks about a very important thing relating to our minds because as Christians oftentimes we don't really emphasize the mind or our thinking processes that much especially among charismatic Christians sometimes and uh, here the apostle talks about the importance of the mind and the New Testament speaks a lot about the mind, the way you think, the, your attitudes and all the processes, the mental processes that are going through you. And so he says, present your bodies, a holy sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable 
service, which can also be translated as worship. Reasonable worship. Now, we are uh, accustomed to thinking of worship as the one and a half or two hours that we spend together. There is worship, that's corporate worship, but that is not all there is to worship. The word worship has been loosely used today. But in the Bible, worship means your service to God as well. You worship together and sing praises to God and pray together with the people of God. And the serving of the Lord, wherever you are, is also worship. Did you get that? When you serve the Lord, you are worshiping the Lord. And there is a sweet-smelling sacrifice and aroma that comes into the presence of the Lord when you serve the Lord. Hallelujah. We serve the Lord and we worship the Lord and it means the same thing. And when we are out in the marketplace bearing witness for Christ and experiencing the ostracism, animosity, rejection and ridicule, what are we doing? We are serving the Lord and we are worshipping the Lord. Because the sacrifice is going to the presence of the Lord. Verse 2, And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. See the focus on the mind. So, in order to serve the Lord, you have to be transformed where? So what do we mean by that? The Holy Spirit working in our minds, changing our values. Because everybody who does not know Christ is seeking one thing, mammon. Jesus did not say it in vain when he said, you cannot serve God and mammon. Mammon is the goddess of wealth. So I've said it over and over again that people become slaves to mammon over their whole lifetime, and then at the end of it, when they think they can enjoy it, they are gone. There's a nice song, I don't know if I can remember all the words. It says something like, castles built upon the sand, though they seem to be so grand, will only fade away and in life's, uh, and will fade away in life's sinking sands, or whatever, something like that. That's true. But if you build your foundation on the rock of ages, it will stand for ever. Hallelujah. And how do you do that? By realizing that the most important thing in life is to seek the kingdom of God. And when you seek the kingdom of God and make it the highest value and priority of your life, you will do everything else well. Because when you are working in the marketplace, you will not cheat, you will not be corrupt, you will do what is right, you will work full and, and, and uh, return to your uh, boss or your employer, the full thing that he's due, otherwise you are living on him rather than on your labor. When we have our minds reoriented, our values changed, then everything else we will do with that consciousness. And that is worship. That is also serving God. So he says, be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Now we go again to verses, uh, uh, down to verse 3, and we read from verses 3 to uh, 6. For I say through the grace given to me, to everyone who is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly as God has dealt to each one a measure of faith. Let's stop there at verse 3. Here, the Apostle Paul is actually expressing a very important psychological concept. It's a concept of self-understanding, self-concept, self-image self-esteem. People who have difficulties in that area 
pay money to psychologists and psychotherapists and psychoanalysts to feel good about themselves. Yeah, Paul is talking about that psychological concept long before Freud and Adler and, uh, and uh, Horney and uh, other great and Carl Gustav Jung who talked about the neuroses of our times and so on long before they came up with their theories. The Bible talks about the importance of the mind and to have a proper estimation of your capabilities and who you are. Self-concept is the a knowledge of what your capabilities and weaknesses are. That's self-concept. Sometimes some people don't understand that and they don't know what their strengths and weaknesses are. Self-esteem is the value that you assign to yourself. Sometimes we say to ourselves, I'm good for nothing. The Bible tells us to have a proper estimation of yourself. Now it also says here, there are some people who are so opinionated and think more highly of themselves than they ought to think. Why does he say that in the context of service? Because some people think that they are too big to serve God. Even some quote-unquote Christians. Then there are others who think that they are not worthy to serve God. And I want to tell you that when you take the step of faith and begin to serve God, all those hang-ups will work themselves out. And because it will work itself out in your life, you will be a more useful being in the marketplace, in your social circuit, among your friends and relatives, because all those hang-ups that you have will be treated by the gifts that God gives to you, and you will discover that you can be a useful person in God's work and in the world. Verse 4, For as we have many members in one body, but all the members do not have the same function. So we being many are one body in Christ and individually members of one another. Having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us. Let us use them. So let's pause there for a minute. Because that's telling us that everybody has different gifts. And when you recognize that other people have gifts that you don't have, and you have gifts that they don't have, what is that going to do to you? You respect and appreciate diversity. Just imagine the mental th change that will take place when you begin to serve, and you realize that God has given you something that's precious, and that is going to uh, not only give you some self-worth and uh, self-esteem as you begin to exercise those gifts, but when you see somebody else who has something different, a different gift and a different ability, you will not be jealous. I don't want to have unhealthy competition. There is healthy competition and there is unhealthy competition. If the issue of jealousy can be dealt with in your life and mine, don't you think you'll be a happier person? Yes or no? Now don't act like you have never been jealous in your life. We all have had those problems. But when you appreciate and you receive and experience the gifts of God and God begins to use you, you will not be competitive in the spiritual dimension. And you say, really? Can people be uh, competitive in the spiritual uh, dimension? <laughs> Yes. Let me stop there. Yes. In fact, Paul referred to it in, in Philippians chapter 1. People can be jealous of other people's spiritual ministries also. 
people can be jealous about other people's spiritual gifts also. We want to be rid of that, don't we? Because anybody who is jealous and competitive is actually a very unhappy person because you're always focusing on other people and what they do. No. But when you have experienced or received the gifts of God and you begin to exercise those gifts, whether it is a small gift or a big gift, it doesn't make any difference. Whether you are a visible person or invisible, that doesn't matter. Because here the Apostle Paul says, every single gift is valuable in the body of Christ. And he uses the example of our bodies. Just because an organ in your body is not seen, do you think that's not important? How many of you can see my physical heart? Can you see your physical heart or mine? Can you? But it's one of the most important organs in the body, right? Then you might say, yes, that's very important. But what about my little finger here? Try getting around every day, doing your business when you have excruciating pain in your finger, one finger. Or just at the extremity only. What's going to happen? Your whole body is going to get affected. What about a toothache? Your whole body is affected. What about a earache? Whole body is affected. Every part of the body is important as far as you are concerned. And in the work of God, every single gift and ministry that the Lord gives is important. So we appreciate diversity. Say it after me. We appreciate and how much that is needed in our society. Is it not? The word gifts there means charismata. The charismata are not only found in 1 Corinthians 12. These are also charismata. Now there are about seven of them here that we read the apostle gives us. Prophecy, ministry, exhortation, giving, leading, mercy. Seven gifts there. Now these gifts... Anybody can receive them and exercise them. When we, let me talk about prophecy. Uh, when we think about prophecy, we think of Isaiah, Jeremiah, uh, Ezekiel, and people like that. That's totally wrong. Because the Old Testament prophets were, uh, were canonical prophets. They spoke the word of God, and every word they spoke was uh, verbatim from the Lord. That's why they said, thus says the Lord which is a standard signature statement of the Old Testament prophet. The New Testament prophet does not operate that way. The New Testament prophet is not the same as the Old Testament prophet. I've said this a hundred times, but I say it again. The New Testament prophet is not the last word on anything. The word of God is the last word. That's why in 1 Corinthians 12 and 14, where Paul talks about the gift of prophecy, he gives the safeguards and the boundaries and he limits the function of prophecy to three things, edification, exhortation, and comfort. But there are many Christians who are being led astray by trying to go for direction to people who have the gift of prophecy. That's wrong. That's wrong. Your direction comes from the Lord into your life through his word and by the spirit. That is why the New Testament prophets like Agabus and others, they did not say, thus says the Lord. They said the Spirit says, because in the New Testament era, the Holy Spirit has been democratized. All of us have the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit gives us a thought or a word, and then we express it in our words. Not so in the Old Testament. Even the words were given by God. I say that because you know that in your workplace, you can have a prophetic word for somebody that edifies, exhorts, and comforts them. If you cannot meet, let's say, if that happens, that doesn't mean you cannot prophesy. You, get a, you pray for somebody and the Holy Spirit 
drops an encouraging, exhorting, edifying word into your heart, you can pick up your phone and call that person and give that word. So prophecy. And that is operative among many people. In our church, we usually uh, share it and say, there's a word from the Lord for you, and it's located in a scripture sometimes. Edifying, building up word. When you receive the gift of prophecy and then you operate, you know what happens to you? You become sensitive. Not only to the Lord, but you become a sensitive person. Next, it talks about the gift of service or ministry, servanthood. When you receive the gift of serving, there are people who, who will do anything that they ask to do. What a fabulous attitude to have. What a fabulous attitude to have. I wish there were more like that. And what happens? When you learn servanthood among the people of God, when you go into the marketplace, it's easy for you even to be a servant leader. Servant leadership didn't come from Simon Greenleaf. It came from the Lord Jesus Christ. They just took biblical ideas and then warmed it up a little bit and gave it in seminars and are charging money for it. Then it talks about teaching, imparting. You have the ability to teach. Our Sunday school teachers are teaching today in the Sunday school rooms down there. And they are teaching. And when they do it, they are imparting something to the kids. And as a result, they are upgrading them. Then he talks about the gift of exhortation which is probably the most common gift in the body of Christ. Some of you have the gift of exhortation, but you don't know that it is the gift of exhortation. The gift of exhortation is that comfort, the word, the lifting up that you give to people with the unction of the Holy Spirit. Somebody is down, you lift them up with a word from the Lord. You know what happens? When you exercise the gift of exhortation, I'm going to tell you the benefit of it. These are unintended benefits of your serving the Lord. When you learn to share a word of exhortation, what happens to you is you improve in your communication. What I'm doing right now is exhortation, actually. It's for a longer time. <laughs> exhortation. So... When you receive a word from somebody and you build them up, you're doing exhortation. Then what's happening to you? You do it continuously. You're going to learn how to communicate an idea with somebody. You're not paid somebody to teach you that. But as you do it by the help of the Holy Spirit, you are improving in your communication. Then giving, these are those who constantly give. And God has blessed them. I'm talking about the normal giving. Some people have the gift of giving. And that teaches you generosity wherever you are, even in the marketplace. Leading, very important gift. What does it mean to lead? To lead means to stand in front of people and show them the way. And interestingly, he says, those who lead, if you look at this verse, uh, leads with diligence, he says. That's verse, verse 8. Those who lead with diligence. Why does he say that? Let me tell you why. Because when you are a leader, even of a group of five people, ten people, or twenty people, you know the biggest issue you'll have is self-motivation. Because there will be things that happen that drive you down, depress you. When somebody does not come for the cell, when somebody says, no, I've stopped coming for it, you know what's going to happen to you? You're going to get knocked psychologically, right? So what do you learn? You learn a very important thing that I hope the whole of Sri Lanka learns. You know what? Self-motivation. And that's something you learn when you're in the ministry. Because you're alone many times. And you've got to motivate yourself. And you're dealing with people's issues and problems and heartaches. It's possible to get down. But what you learn on the run, on the road, is how to motivate yourself through the Word of God by the power of your Holy Spirit. So when you are leading among the people of God, you learn something for which you'll have to pay money 
to go and learn, and it may not even work. You learn by the power of the Holy Spirit to motivate your self. And isn't that going to help you in the marketplace? Of course. If you are a true disciple of Christ, you will be self-motivated and you will do your job whether the boss is watching or not. Where did you learn it? You learned it by serving the Lord. Oftentimes we don't realize the things we learn in, uh, when we are with the people of God from one another for free. Then uh, he says in verse 8, He who shows mercy with cheerfulness, that is, those who are engaged in mercy ministries, like, for instance, like our hope hampers. What happens to people who are constantly involved in mercy ministries, helping people who are down and helping people who don't have what they need? Again, you get a little down. <laughs> you get discouraged. So you have a problem. You got to now deal with it. And the Apostle Paul says, when you're doing it, You've got the gift, mercy, it's a charismata from God. That's why you're helping people and you feel broken and concerned about them. Now serve them with cheerfulness because charismata means gifts of grace. In other words, you cannot exercise it unless you have the grace of God. So when you're down, you ask for God's grace to come up. And then you're sitting at your desk in your office on Monday and something comes your way on your plate, on your lap that puts you down. Your natural instinct is to say, Lord, I'm down right now. Give me grace. Lift me up. Despite all these terrible things that's happening right here, give me the grace to stand up and serve you in this place. You have learned to seamlessly be a disciple of Christ serving him in the marketplace as well. Then it says, verses 9 to 13, Let love be without hypocrisy. Abhor what is evil. Cling to what is good. Be kindly affectionate to one another with brotherly love. In honor, giving preference to one another. Not lagging in diligence, fervent in spirit, Serving the Lord, rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, continuing steadfastly in prayer, distributing to the needs of the saints given to hospitality. Now, you know what's happening here? What he's trying to tell us? As the people of God, as we work together, as we serve together in his body, in the local church, something is going to happen to you. Graces are going to flow. And uh, we know that if you're a Christian, you have to be a very loving person. But sometimes we tend to be a little hypocritical about it. We wear a mask. So he says, if you love, love sincerely. Don't just put on a face mask. Not this kind of mask. There are other invisible masks. <laughs> That's what he means. Let love be without hypocrisy. Abhor what is evil. Cling to what is good. You learn to be a person who can discern between what is right and wrong. Be kindly affection to one another. So, with brotherly love. Now, everybody who has grown up as a kid, and if you're in your family, you have, you, you have siblings, you have a problem, right? You have a problem. Because you bump into each other. And when you're young, you may think, ah, these guys are impossible to live with. And let's say two of you are sharing a room. I mean, one half of the room is very nice, the other half is a total mess. Okay? And it's chaotic living like that. Yeah. But you go on like that. And one day you go to a university and you have a dorm. <laughs> and you have a nutcracker. So, what's happened? Your experience has helped you now to cope with that. 
We are all rough, unpolished diamonds. Don't forget that. Say it. We are all rough, unpolished diamonds. And it's by rubbing together with each other that we get polished. So when you go to work, and that thorn in the flesh is on your right side, <laughs> you've already gone through it. Kindness, sociability, honor others, respect. You learn that in the church too. Because in, in church you find that you can't do as you please. There is a structure of authority, there is an order, there is a way to do things. And you commit yourself, let's say, to do the worship team. And then uh, somebody comes and tells you, no, that's not the way we do it. This is the way to do it. And if you're a very high-minded, highly opinionated person, then it's going to prick you there. Well, if you stay with it, what's going to happen? You're going to go to get cut down to size and you will shine where there was sandpaper before. Rejoicing, patience, prayer, you learn inner ruggedness, hospitality, what a wonderful gift that is. You learn to be personable and your human relations improve. That helps you in the place outside. So, I want to tell you that if you really serve the Lord and you carry through with the commitment that you made, you will learn, among other things, you will have self-understanding, self-esteem, you will appreciate diversity, you will get rid of uh, jealousy and unhealthy competition, you will develop your self-motivation, you will also develop pure motivation because you will not want to do things with ulterior intents. Transparency and openness, which is a very important and required thing in our uh, society, and egalitarianism, realizing that God can use anybody. It does not matter. And when you are in the process of doing this, the last section is verses 14 to 21, and I want to explain that to you by, by reading first verse 20. Let's read verse 20 altogether, then I'll explain that. Therefore, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him a drink. For in so doing, you will heap coals of fire on his head. All that is good, but you don't understand what is the meaning or the connection of this heaping coals of fire on his head. And sometimes you may think, oh, Paul is saying punish the fellow. Give him beans, put fiery coals on his head. What does it mean? Let me explain to you. And that whole section will make sense then. In the olden days, coals were used both for heat in the home as well as cooking, just like firewood. And so all these hot coals were in a container in the house. And sometimes, in a home, the coals may have run out or lost their heat at a very important time maybe. Then what would the person do? They would put the container on their head, of course not bare head, they would put something else like you have seen our vendors do sometimes. They put the container of empty container on their head and they would go to the neighbor. And when the neighbor would go, uh, they would go to the neighbor. If the neighbor was a generous woman, she would put an extra amount of coals in that container. She would heap the coals. So what does it show? It shows generosity on the part of the person when somebody else had a need. And so Paul is talking about moral and spiritual and mental generosity. And that's what you need. When verses 14 to 21 talk to us about our behavior and our interactions in the world, the church builds you up, teaches you. You have an opportunity to learn from brothers and sisters and, and 
uh, get irritated and yet be forgiven. And then when you get built up in that way, then you can go out into the world, and that is this section, and, and successfully deal with the neuroses of life. The neuroses of life are the things that we cannot stand. The psychotic is the person who says 2 plus 3 equals 4. But the neurotic is the person who says 2 plus 2 equals 4 and I cannot stand it. That's the difference. So you're a normal person, but you can't stand what's going on and all of us have a certain amount of neurosis in our lives. We are all neurotics, only the difference is the degree, okay? So, when you're out there in the world, there are things that bother us and pressurize us. Persecution. It says, bless them, heap coals of fire. Rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. What are going to happen to you? You're going to be an empathetic person. You won't be a schizophrenic, don't worry about it. You'll be an empathetic person. You'll be humble, humility, you'll have opportunities. And you will decide, no, I'm not going to retaliate. I experienced these things at home, but from that I learned, I'm not going to retaliate. I'm going to be peaceable, verse 18, verse 19, not take revenge when people do things that are bad to me. In other words, Romans 12 talks about serving through the gifts with grace. And when you do, you are going to be better off as a person and you will deal with the neuroses of life as well as be a person who is useful in the kingdom of God. I invite you to... to uh, Ask the infilling of the Holy Spirit into your life so that you can serve God with grace and gifts. And especially for those of you who came forward and committed your life and covenanted that you will serve the Lord, I look forward, we all look forward, all our pastors look forward to a great year of serving the Lord. And as we prayed, that there be a great harvest and laborers will come forth and you are one of them. Pray to the Lord and they were all filled with joy. Ephesians chapter 5 verses 18 and 19 says be continuously filled. It's not a uh, suggestion. It is a command, imperative. Be continuously filled with the Holy Spirit. And what is the process? You sing to the Lord and sing to each other in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs and you praise the Lord. And in that process, mysteriously, the Holy Spirit fills us and empowers us to serve Him and to do His will. So I'm inviting you to rise to your feet, wherever you are, just open yourself to the Holy Spirit. He's already in you. Believe that the Lord is going to fill you and strengthen you as we worship the Lord.